Um, next up, we will peel back the curtain on the writer's room for yet another great conversation. Leading showrunners will share their experiences, insights, and advice on how to successfully navigate a writer's room. From what it takes to be hired on staff to what it takes to become invaluable to the room and how to move up. Following the live panel, there will be audience Q&A. Again, use those Q&A functions right there at the bottom of your screen to submit your questions. And we'll get to as many questions as we possibly can. Leading our next panel, we have Director, CBS Diversity Writers Mentoring Program, and Director, WGA Showrunner Training Program, and author of a fabulous book loaded with practical advice titled Hollywood Game Plan, How to Land a Job in Film, TV, and Digital Entertainment, the one and only. Please give a warm welcome to Carol Kirshner. Thanks, Dana. <laughs> I appreciate that. Um, Anyways, hello and welcome. We have a great panel today that is gonna give a look inside the writer's room. We are very fortunate to have three esteemed showrunners with us who are gonna share their experience, insights, and wisdom. First, Nichelle Tramble Spellman, sorry, Nichelle, <laughs> uh, Dana Lynn North, and Alexander Wu. Since you have their bios and we have limited period of time, I'm gonna jump right into our questions. So starting with you, Dana, can you briefly tell us what you're working on now and how you got into your first writer's room? Sure. Um, <clears throat> I am currently uh, co-creating and co-show running the uh, Best Man the final chapters, a limited series that is um, in development uh, at Peacock with uh, Malcolm D. Lee, Malcolm and I, who, you know, he currently has a little movie called Space Jam that's in theaters and he <laughs> created the best, the you know, that, that old thing. Um, and Malcolm wrote the best man uh, movies that uh, are, are beloved, uh, the best man and the best man holiday. And we are for Peacock, we are uh, doing a limited series um, of the, the next sort of the next chapter as we're calling the final chapters. So I'm in that room and I'm also developing um, a number of projects um, with and an overall deal um, at Sony Pictures that I'm super excited about. So I have a number of things that are, you know, in various phases with them um, that I'm, you know, in the lab on uh, with different writers. So um, that's what I'm up to currently. Um, and then my first show um, was Any Day Now um, on Lifetime. And I had that, that route that I really value so much because it serves me very well now, which we'll talk about later, um, which was that I went from being a writer's assistant to a writer on Any Day Now. Um, Nancy Miller, the creator of that show, gave me my break. I was in the writer's room on Any Day Now and then well, I went on to write freelance scripts and become a writer. So that was my first room. That's and great. Hey, that man. is and hello, <laughs> that is absolutely a trajectory uh, to get into a writer's room. Nichelle, what are you working yeah. on now? What have you been working on? And how did you get into your first room? Well, um, I created a show for Apple called Truth Be Told, starring Octavia Spencer. And we season one came out two years ago. Season two premieres on August 20th. And this year it is Octavia Spencer and Kate Hudson. And they're wonderful together. And I'm um, just starting the room for season three. And um, what's taken up most of my time are two feature projects, one for Netflix starring Kerry Washington, which is going to be fun. It's the kind of movie I miss in the theaters and a, um, and a project for MGM about Jimi Hendrix. So I got into television by going through the CBS Writers Program in 2007 with you, Carol. And then I was I staffed on Women's Word yeah. right at the end of that. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Great. And, and, how did you get staffed on that? Was it through the program or was it another way? Gosh, it's so long ago. I feel like it was the program. I left the program early and it was through an agent meeting. Now I remember. There you go. Yeah, I left That's the program about two weeks before we were all, all uh, wrapped up. Yeah, you were our rock star because you got staffed <laughs> before the show, before the program was over. Alexander Wu, <laughs> talk to us. What are you doing now? And uh, how'd you get into your first room? 
Hi, Carol. Uh, my, my, <laughs> what I what I mainly do with my life is I'm mainly a housekeeper and a Zoom tutor, and in my spare time I make TV shows. <laughs> Uh, when you have two small children, that's that's my main job. Um, I am I'm under overall uh, over at Netflix, and uh, I'm uh, the co-creator of a science fiction project called The Three Body Problem with uh, uh, David Benioff and Dan Weiss. And there should be some mm. casting announcements coming out soon, so that should be very exciting. And about to uh, head on over uh, to uh, start pre-production uh, very soon as well. Uh, actually, pre-production starting. I'm about to go join them. Uh, and Where? And I uh, in the UK. Oh, so, okay. Well, Travel far away. And then the other. Uh, I, I'm also developing another project um, uh, of my own that is about uh, ultra-rich uh, mainland Chinese living in the San Gabriel Valley. And boba, so that's, 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 that's the other thing. I, uh, I, got, I got my first job. Oh, got a million years ago, two thousand three. Uh, I had had a play in New York. I started as a playwright and uh, was uh, was doing that for. I was in theater for seven years for no other reason than because I loved it. It gave me joy to do. Uh, certainly wasn't in it for the money because there was none. And I, uh, I had a play that uh, I, I can't say it did well. I can't claim it did well because it didn't do well, but it did get a very nice review in the New York Times. And that uh, helped me get my first staff job, um, which is a show called Wonderfalls. So my first bosses were Brian Fuller and Tim Minear and Todd Holland, which is a pretty good start. Wow, wow. <laughs> that is great. That is great. Yeah. Television, just so people know, they love playwrights. They love playwrights. So if you're a playwright, have a great uh, play that an agent or manager or executive can help you get in the hands of a showrunner. Okay, um, Nichelle, as a showrunner, what are you looking for when you read a script to hire a lower level staff writer? And then how is it different for an upper level staff writer? What, do you, what, what makes a script just sing? Well, I think for, I'm looking for really good character work from all samples, whether it's upper level or lower level. Um, on Truth Be Told, even though there is a murder mystery at the base of it, it's really a family drama, crime drama. So I really need people who can spend a moment with the characters, are not afraid of emotion. That's a big deal for me. And when I'm talking to upper level writers, it's really about what they can handle. Are you good in post? Can you take over casting? Can you run the room if I have to step away? Those kind of functional things, that's really what I'm looking for in addition to good writing with the upper levels. And with the lower levels, it's a voice and a point of view and something that just cracks a little different on the page. I think that I had come back to speak at the CBS program and met Joseph Sawyer the year he was in, and he had a um, one hour drama about Mike Tyson at 14. And I just thought, that's interesting to me. You know, that's like different from a, a procedural or, or a medical drama, which I also enjoy, but it just gave me insight into where his brain cracks and what he was interested in. And so that felt like something that I could take advantage of in the room because his character work was so strong. So that's base, the baseline for everything when I do the hiring. Great, and, and let me just ask you, because people ask me this all the time, what is it on the page? I understand now that the concept is important. It should be something that just tweaks your interest, but what on the page sort of specifically gets you excited? When you make unusual choices, and I think that, and by that, I don't mean razzle dazzle. I don't mean a car chase. I don't mean, you know, guns coming out. I think if you make an interesting emotional choices in a scene or with the characters and something kind of unexpected, if I'm following along the, the um, what was the movie on HBO Max or the limited series? It's a sin. I loved that limited series and he made unusual emotional choices all the way through. Anything that you thought was going to happen because you'd seen it before and it wasn't big fireworks. It was just an emotional honesty he followed all the way through. And that's interesting to me and not running away from emotion. If there's a scene that's heartbreaking and you're sad, it doesn't need to be cut through with a joke. Just kind of having the confidence on the page to stand behind any choice you're making for your characters or for the plot. And you could, it's hard to explain, but when you read it and you and you 
you could recognize it when you're reading it and that's it. Great, thank you. Alex, what do you look for in a script from a lower level writer that gets you excited? Um, well, as, as uh, Nichelle mentioned, uh, for, for a lower level writer, really all you're looking for is what's on the page. You know, you're not, you don't have any expectations for that person to run the room or, or be on set or even post yet, you know, at this, at this stage of their careers. Um, I, I, you know, I don't want to repeat everything that Michelle said, but that's, that's, you know, that's very much uh, what I'm looking for too. There's a confidence that you can tell. There is a, 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 a work that is that is sharp and and makes choices that because we've read tons and tons of scripts in our lives by this point um choices that surprise me um dialogue that surprises me but also you know the script is at this point in the process the script is the only thing you have there is no cinematographer there are no costume designers there's no production designers so the writer of the script has to do that in script as well through the pacing of the uh, of, of the st of the uh, descriptions, through parentheticals, whatever it may be, through if you can suggest it through dialogue. I mean, there are things that you can do to suggest the tone and the world um, without having you have to read an instruction book because that also slows down the pace of the read. Um, so there is, uh, I the thing I I I think that you can tell when. Uh, a script really excites me is you can feel the joy. I can feel mm. someone is really having a good time uh, uh, writing it. And it doesn't have to be a, a comedy. They just are, they are just, they, they're in the zone. They feel good about what they're writing. And, uh, and, and you can tell because there's a confidence to it. They're not making safe decisions, not making safe choices all the time, not relying on cliches, not falling back on things. Um, that's usually what I'm looking for, which is why I, maybe I'm, I'm in a minority here and, and controversially, I really, really don't like books on screenwriting. And I really, really don't like courses on screenwriting too. Someone is going to have a, a, probably get very mad at me for that. Uh, because often you will put a peek for one, for, for, you know, one eye, you know, uh, off the road just to make sure you're doing the right thing. And then you start to write from a place of, of less confidence and a little bit of fear. And I think for people who have read scripts their whole lives, you can tell that. And, and How often. Often a script, often a book on screenwriting is more crippling than freeing, and that's that's my caution. Against <laughs> it. I love that, Dana. What do you think about that? No, I, I think that's a great point. And actually, while we're wading into potentially controversial waters, I was trying to think of like what could I possibly add to all the you know great things of, that have been said on this topic. And the only thing I think I could add is like um, I'm looking for a script that engages me so much from a from a lower level level writer in particular, um, on top of all of the great things that I completely co-sign, a script that it grabs me so much that I want to finish it. Because you know, I think the yeah. one unsaid thing is that right. You know, we're reading a lot of stuff. There, there's the whole um, you know, um, often there's that thing that if I'm looking at five pages, ten pages, fifteen pages, it doesn't take long to know, to feel like, okay, how much more of this do I want to read? Um, how much more of this do I need to read? Is this script so good that I'm feeling like, wow, I really want to keep going. Wow, I this, you know, something about these surprises, these this dialogue, the flow of this, the story they decided to tell is making me go, I really want to keep going. Like, I'm looking for that. I'm looking for a script that, that pulls me in for all the reasons that have been stated so much that I want to keep going because there are a lot of scripts that you get to page 10 and you don't feel compelled to keep going. So I'm looking for that as well. That is great. Now, let me ask you this, just so people have a sense of what we're talking about, how many scripts, and, and just chime in, do you read for a position during season? How, how many scripts, how big is your pile of scripts? Anybody? That's how it, it varies so much and it, I mean, by, for so many reasons, I don't even know how, a good way to how to answer that because it depends on a lot of things. I'm thinking okay. season one. I think I read way more than I did for season two because there were writers that were coming back. And season one, it was staffing the entire room. 
So I think season oh. one, it was over 60 for sure. Um, oh man. <laughs> per position, yeah. per position. Oh, no, 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 no. Oh, just total, you know, was over 60 at least total because I'm trying to remember that graph form that I used to make notes. But um, mm -hmm. I think on an average, probably about 12 to 15 per position. And that's sometimes because the recommendations are, mm -hmm. you know, the samples are coming in from agents, but then there's a writer friend that says, hey, take a look at this writer. I know you're staffing up. So mm -hmm. it just kind of, it feels like it keeps, it keeps going and it keeps flowing, even if you have a specific um, reading period. Mm -hmm. Okay. Alex, yeah, that's what I mean. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. I was going to say between no, 10 no, and I'm 20. Sorry. I was just, mm -hmm. I'm sorry. Okay, so Alex Anywhere is from, 10 no, and 20. That's about right. Dana. Yeah, yeah I mean, okay. I think this most recently, that's, I would say that's about right. I, I would say anywhere from, yeah, mine was probably a little, somewhere between, yeah, about eight to, like, I'm trying, eight to 15. That's, I, I wasn't, I don't think it was quite as high as 20 this last time for the, this room was a little smaller. I feel like it was, Probably a little under 20, but anywhere from, yeah, something like that, 8 to 15 or so, which is a wide number, I know. It varied because some, some positions we read fewer, some we read more, you know, that type of thing. But it's, yeah. But this, this it's is to lot. say, this, it, is, this is after it's gone through a process of, you know, usually when there's multiple so people whittling. who can read scripts, it gets whittled down and whittled down. And the studio might have some people that they really, really like, and other producers mm -hmm. might have people they really, really like. And then by the time you get to your core group, you know, the, the, the most senior writers on the team usually will get together and find, okay, this is the group that we should really all consider and read. Uh, so when, when there's more yes. people, you know, at the top to help out, you know, then there's fewer scripts that we all, you know, we, we, we have to go through. If it's just me, it can be a very large number. Yeah. Mm -hmm. the, with, yeah. Uh, Hello, Hello Sunshine, they're the producers on um, Truth Be Told, and they do a lot of the initial reading for me. And then I had a showrunner's assistant who really knew my taste and did, a, would whittle down from their pile. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Same here. It's it's a lot. It is a lot of scripts. And you have mm -hmm. to, anyone that wants to get into the room, you have to stand out from all those scripts. Okay, so you love the script. You set up an interview. What makes an interview great? And what makes an interview suck? What, what mis let's start with the mistakes. People always learn from mistakes. What did somebody do in an interview that you went, no, this, no, this is over? Uh, Alex? A bad interview that you had with a. I don't know if anyone's writer. ever done something that 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 really makes me, you know, just you know, completely shut down. I'll say it is highly subjective because you know everyone's going to have a totally different answer depending on who is who you're interviewing with. I think by the time you get to the point of an interview, the showrunner has read the material, so the you know the the work is good. That's not the point. You know the the subtext of any of these conversations is. Can I spend the next potential, potentially next few months or years of my life with this person? Um, and how does this person fit with everyone else that we have uh, that we have on the team? Um, so that uh, and that is highly subjective. You know, I uh, I know several very close friends and colleagues who really, really want passion, deep passion. Uh, and 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 deep commitment, uh, you know, really really want to do it, uh, because I'm uh, allegedly emotionally dead inside. That I don't like that as much. <laughs> I think I feel things, but how would I know, right? Um, I, I yeah I I am. I think admittedly a little more clinical when I approach things. I think I do write things that are very emotional, but if I myself get emotional, you know, I, I, I know someone who's a showrunner who loves, loves it when everyone cries in the room. And I, I would be <laughs> horrified if everyone was crying in the room. I, I would feel like it's gone terribly, terribly wrong if in the breaking of a story, we all start breaking down in tears. So I have a different, you know, uh, 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 you know, um, 
set of things that I respond to. I love enthusiasm. Right. You know, I, one of the things that really uh, that really uh, um, speaks to me is when someone says, "I want to do this show. I want to do this project because right. this is really right. you know." Um, the things that on the other side might just be like, "I want to. You know, I just want to get a job. You know, like I'll, do, I'll take any job." That tends to <laughs> give me less confidence that they're going to you know be someone who's really committed to wanting to to do this particular show. Sure. Uh, Dana, anybody that shot themselves in the foot that you can share so that uh, we know what not to do? Uh, I'm thinking about that. I mean, I, I, you know, yes to passion. I, I agree with like having that sense of, it, for me, I want to know that someone has a sense of emotional maturity. So it's also, I want to know that you're able to play well with others in like a real way. And so um, I, I agree that it is important to me that um, someone be passionate, be but also be emotionally mature. So I'm actually thinking about some times where, you know, I think, you know, I, I feel like a lot of times in, in meetings and interviews, people understandably, um, try to kind of present a version of themselves that is often a little bit, you know, you're a little bit more on a lot of times in meetings, right? So it might be a bit of a heightened, let's say, heightened version of yourself. But sometimes I think a person's heightened version of themselves can can be a little bit of like a, right, that, oh, I don't know if I want to be in a room with this energy all day, you know? And so I can think of times when I've, yeah, come out of meetings feeling that way, feeling like, and I, you know, recognizing that, like, I get that this might be a heightened version of you, but it might also just be you. Um, and some, you know, sometimes I, you know, I'm, I consider myself to actually be pretty good at reading people. And sometimes I can tell, like, okay, I can tell that you're kind of doing the like, I'm going to be on for this meeting. Sometimes I can feel that, but sometimes I feel like this seems like just you on a Tuesday. And if that's the case, <laughs> like, I, you know, I don't think I'm, I don't think I can do that. Um, you know, so I've come out of some meetings feeling that where it's just, and that thing where a person, you know how you want it, most of us, you know, you want to find that natural balance in a room. And there's, there's such a thing as like leading from behind in a meeting where you want it, where I believe it's a good thing to try to go, I'm going to be in this meeting. There may be some things that I, that I know I want to, present about myself, right? Someone might ask you a question, you might answer that question, but you might also have in your mind, I want to make sure that these showrunners, you know, know this about me, or I may want to share, you know, that's all fine. But then there's that thing of people who just kind of don't have that awareness of just give and take, you know? So things like that right. are the things that concern me where I feel like, you know what I mean? When you feel like a person doesn't have an awareness of of balance, of give and take, of when to stop talking, which I'm about to do now, meaning stop talking. But things like that are the things that, that concern me. Um, Got those it. are some of the things that I notice. Thank you. Thank I think you. My favorite one... quote is actually one of Tuesday. Um, I'm sorry, Nichelle, go ahead. The biggest. I think the biggest one for me is that you're not prepared for the meeting. It tells me everything about what you're going to be like in the room. If you're going to have the research, if you're going to you know, read the writer's notes to answer some of the questions that you might bring to the room instead. You know, um, so if you've come to a meeting and you haven't read the, sh you know, you haven't watched the show or you haven't read the script, if there, you, you haven't read the book that it's based on. Um, we had a meeting recently, my husband and I have our, our, have a production company and we had a meeting recently for an assistant and um, you know, they hadn't watched Truth Be Told, that's fine. They hadn't watched Hip Hop Uncovered, which was the other show Malcolm did this year. They hadn't watched Falcon and Winter Soldier. And so I was desperate and I was like, good wife, justified, you know, I'm going way back in the crates, Empire. <laughs> <laughs> Do you even know why you're here? And so that lack of preparation is a massive red flag for me. Sure, <laughs> sure. Um, okay, so- on the yeah, other side Alex. of that, Carol, I did once have a meeting where a lower level writer came in with notes on my script. That also I didn't love. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> wow. So I, I just, I have some thoughts. I have some thoughts on what I feel like you could have handled a little bit better. I just, oh. really, that's, that's amazing. <laughs> that's amazing. Maybe he was right at the time. I just like, oh boy. Oh man. <laughs> wow. Um, okay. 
that you loved them on the page, you loved them in the room, you loved them in the, in the interview, they're in the room. What makes someone value added in the room? What makes, I mean, I think we all know about upper level. It's that they can help you, help you, help you. What about that first time or second time writer? What makes them value added in a room? I think that, um, um, you know, it's, it's a skill that you learn as a, as you are in rooms and you get more experience, but you know, the biggest one that you have to learn and makes it and makes you most helpful in the room is that you pitch solutions. If you're looking at the board and you absolutely know that's not working, it's not helpful to say, you know what, that, that piece of business in, in act three doesn't work. And then you stop, you say that piece of business in act three doesn't work. And here's a way that I think if we, if we're married to this, that it may work if we step it out if a little bit more, or here's an alternate pitch, because I think that this is going to give us problems going forward. So pitching, um, uh, solutions to problems and not just pitching the problem, not filibustering. That's a huge one for me when you like suck all the air up out of the room because you're going on and on and on and um, being helpful and anticipating things. If you, you know, see that people are spinning around a subject and then they move on. If you came in the next day and said, Hey, I looked into this last night and I think this is a piece of, of, of the research that I came in in with that might help that story. So best being present and helpful and um, on top of things and um, and the no filibustering. <laughs> that's a huge one for me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, that's great. Uh, Dana, what would you, what makes somebody value added in the room for you? Um, yeah, I, I mean, I agree. Being, being someone who, it, you know, brings an energy that is, that helps to like be a problem solver being a source of of story being a source of like yeah how to get how to get us out of corners you know i work in a lot you know comedy and dramedy a lot as well as drama so being also just a source of like of of positive energy and like and joy like you know so even though which sounds may sound abstract but it's like but being a, a story generator and that can come in a lot of different ways um so yeah as, as well as not being a, a a story vampire and someone who's like sucking energy out, but like someone that you know is is likely to be that person who can look at something in a different way. So that if you get in some kind of corner and get to where you're spinning your wheels, yeah, that person that is an outside the box thinker in a room. And it's, and particularly if they are kind of like a lower mid-level person, it's, you know, they may not be, you, you're not looking to them to run the room and all that, but that person that you know is likely to maybe pitch something in a super outside the box way. And it may not be the the fix that solves everything, but it may be the thing that kind of like loosens up the stuckness and, you know, and just has everyone like, well, that, you know, makes everybody laugh because it's so ridiculous or starts people in like a, that may not work, but like this could work or, you know, just starts everyone thinking in a different way. Um, so just the, the outside the box thinkers, the people that are, that are, that tend to be story generators and also people who are not, um, afraid to, to just share the over, I'm, I'm, this will probably shock you. I'm an oversharer in, in <laughs> my rooms and I appreciate people who, um, are willing to, to be that as well. Again, from a place of, of fun and a place of, you know, a good personal story about some mistakes that somebody's made is always just again, a good way to generate some energy and some story, things like that. Great. What makes a lower level writer value added in a room? Well, I think there's an alchemy to, to every single room. And I, if, I, if I knew what the formula was to putting together the exact right group of people every time I could I, I bottle it and sell it, and, but I don't know that. Um, I, one thing that I've I've found, maybe this is coming from having grown up in creative writing workshops and playwriting workshops, is that the people who have had experience, if not necessarily in a writer's room, but in those workshop kind of settings, uh, have tended to have a better sense of um, 
I'm, I'm stealing this from a, a, a showrunner I work for once, a, a room hygiene of what uh, of of how to work within the dynamic of the of the room as a whole so building on someone else's idea someone has an idea but isn't quite able to articulate it helping that out um as opposed to bringing in your own idea or trying to you know uh, monkey wrench something else into the uh in, in, into the conversation um if you know if we're talking about this one thing right now how can i help uh, help uh, help build on it if you know the room is in need of some levity you know then you know bring a little bit of of, of levity into it if if it is uh if there's some bit of research that hasn't uh, that that you know we probably should have done and didn't do you know you come in and it's like you know I, I i did a little bit of googling last night um and 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 being able to add in in that respect so there's many different kinds of times there there might be a need if there's i don't know i haven't been in this type of situation but there's, there's a conflict between two other writers and there's a palpable tension being able to diffuse that should not be the job of a lower level uh a writer but someone could also just make the day go a little bit nicer that helps also um, so there's a lot in reading the room uh, uh, that uh, where one person could be helpful. Uh, and uh, a lot of it, I think, comes from the experience of being in that kind of situation and short of, I think, being in a, a workshop or group where you try to try to help other people with their own work or their own ideas. Uh, I don't know if there's a, a real way of, of learning that without being in it. Sure, sure. Thank you. Well, okay, so talking about being in the room, as a showrunner, how do you set the tone in your rooms so that diverse voices and points of view are heard and respected? I just state it plain up top when we start the room and when I start it in the hiring process. So part of the due diligence that I do is I call about a writer that I'm interested in and everybody will make the call to the showrunner to say, what were, they, what were they like in the room, blah, 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 blah. But the business is so you know small and everybody's wrapped around each other that I usually make a call to a writer who's just in the room because I feel like rooms have different personalities. There's a personality when the showrunner's there and then there's the personality of the room when the showrunner is gone. So the showrunner could definitely have an impression of a writer and how they function and work in a room that's different from what their colleagues who are there with them all day. So I usually get, you know, one or two references. And then in the, you know, our sit down meeting, I say it's very important that it's a respectful room, that people are adults. I don't like a lot of bullshit. I don't like politics. Um, I don't like nastiness. And I feel like everybody should support one another. And then I ask the lower levels to kind of almost adopt a, um, the upper level to almost adopt a lower level so that the lower levels have at least one person that they know that they could talk to if something's bothering them. And, you know, it on Good Wife, which was a very adult room, that was the format that I've carried forward. And it's like acknowledging someone else's pitches. Um, if you interrupt, apologizing for it. And it's not where it's stiff. It's just basic manners. And I think that if, you know, if I do it, at the beginning, then everybody mimics it. And then it becomes the thing that we do in the room. It's just like, oh, um, I think that you had something to say, but you were interrupted. What was going on there? What's your thought? Blah, blah, blah. And calling people out by name, acknowledging something that they're set, they've said. And I swear after two days in the room and everyone sees, oh, this is going to be a respectful room. This is going to be a room where we support each other. They all fall in line and they love it. And it's been interesting to see the people who have, and I don't want to um, overuse this term, but the people who have sort of PTSD from bad rooms where they were abused or yelled at or had things thrown at them or they couldn't talk. And, you know, one of my writers season one said, how many questions do I get? And I said, what does that mean? And they were like, how many questions do I get before you get angry? And I'm like, that is so, wow. I'm so sorry about whatever has happened to you in the past, but that doesn't exist here. And so I just think being respectful of other people is just the order of the day. Yeah. That is great. That uh, people want to be in your room, Alex. How do you set the tone? 
I, I think it starts with who you hire. I, 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 I think if, I don't know, if someone is, is disrespectful in a room and, and shuts out other people's voices, I don't know, you know, it's kind of my fault for having hired that person. You know, <laughs> I, 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 everything I can, I, 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 as someone who doesn't really enjoy conflict, I really do everything I can not to have people who are like that. Uh, not to you know hire people who are like that. So I think I've been pretty lucky in in that regard uh, that I have, haven't had to uh, work for or alongside too many people uh, um, who are like that. But I I, I kind of I think that's kind of my job to not not create that kind of situation. If I have inadvertently hired someone who who causes that, I guess I. I would take them aside in a in a in a on a one on one situation and have a conversation, but luckily I haven't had to. Right, Dana. On on day one, is there something you say to your staff in the room, or how how do you establish that tone so that all people are heard? Um, <clears throat> just to echo some of what has been said, it is kind of it does go along with that whole cliche about how so much of making um, a film or a TV series is about casting. Like a huge part of your job is done when you hire the right people, a big part of it is done. And then yes, alongside that, it is also about um, the, you know, the tone you set in the beginning as far as, you know, kind of what are the, I call it more like visions and values, even for me, even in the languaging, some people might call it ground rules or like, this is how we're gonna do things. But even for me in the, languaging that I use around how are we going to write, wh how are we going to play in this playground? What are, you know, what, so yes, I, I do, um, you know, set a tone, but it's also, you know, as Michelle was saying, it's also the modeling of like, how do we treat each other in this room? So, and it's even more important while we're in a, a visual, I mean, a virtual um, medium, it's even more important, but you know, when we're in person as well, yeah, the idea of, of course, from whether, you know, from a staff writer to a co-EP, everyone understanding that like, you know, that we're, that everyone's got a right to be heard. Like a, the staff writer that is on, um, actually the, she's a story editor, the, the quote unquote lowest level writer in the room. Cause even that people understanding that like, um, you know, in some rooms, people's titles matter much more than other rooms, you know, all of that kind of thing. People understanding that like, if you have a pitch you know, pitch your pitch and it's not, you know, because there was a writer who was like, I was told that like, I wasn't supposed to talk because I'm a lower, you know, like people will go, like lower level writers will go to lunch with other writers and, and then have all these preconceived notions when they come in a room, you know? So um, having to kind of, you know, as Nisho was saying, people come understanding like, oh, I'm in a safe space, you know, that kind of thing. People understanding that you're in a safe space in this room, you're, what you have to say is important in this room. I value and everyone in this room values your contribution. So it's it's about, you know, what tone is being set with, with the actual ground rules and the actual visions and values of my particular room. And then what is modeled? Like, how do I say, actually, I, this person was starting to speak, so I want to hear the rest of what they have to say, person who just interrupted them. You know, actually, I want to hear what you have to say as well, but I want I want this person to finish what they were saying. You know, so sometimes it's just the basic, like, and people get excited. Like, some of it is not, you know, like, sometimes some, no, someone is not consciously trying to shut another person down. They're trying, sometimes people are just getting excited, but when you when you call attention to I understand that you really wanted to pitch your thing, but you just cut somebody off and I want to hear that, you know, sometimes when, when you just spend a few days actually, again, like setting the tone both in word and in action and everybody's seeing like, oh, this is how we're going to do this. Yeah, then they do. Then everyone starts to, to do it and it becomes like, oh, okay, this is how we're doing it in this room. So yeah, it, it really is. It is just kind of like stating that this is the way we're going to do it and then continuing to do it in both word and action and creating a safe space in the, in the way that I speak and in the way that I um, create space for everyone. And then it, it does, it becomes a self, what is it? There's a, a cool way to say it that I can't self think of, but it continues to self, self generating, I guess, you know what I mean? At a certain point, right? It does continue to, to everyone does fall in line with that. And it's, and, and it's, a, and, and it's such an energy that we, I think we all actually want to be in that energy, but, more than in a toxic energy, but you know, it just is kind of, yeah, whatever, whatever the leadership does that definitely perpetuates. 
Sure, sure. That is great. All of your rooms sound wonderful. Um, <laughs> but what if, what if, in spite of you setting the tone, in spite of you modeling, in spite of you being awesome, there is some serious conflict in the room? How do you manage it? Anybody? I think you just have to. You have to deal with it directly. I saw, I saw the potential for that on, I'm not gonna name the show, but I saw the potential for that on a show and I was not even a, um, an upper level, but I felt like I was an adult. And so I went on the, uh, took the person on a walk and we just went out for, at the lunch break and it seemed like, hey, you wanna go for a walk? And I'm going over here, we could stretch our legs. And then after a bunch of chit chat, I said, hey, if you don't mind, here's something that I would love to tell you that I could see. And based on the expressions of some of the other people in the room, I think they're seeing it too. It's going to lead to this kind of trouble. And here's why it's important to you to kind of try and fix it. If you're performing for the showrunner so that they hire you or the, they promote you, you are discounting the seven other people in the room who either are going to have shows of their own or go off in other rooms where people are looking for writers. So you're performing in this room at a level that's going to eliminate you from about nine jobs. So you need to make a little bit of an attitude adjustment understand what's going on. If you feel this kind of energy coming back, excuse yourself and go take a walk, but you need to dial it down because everyone's picking up on it. And these are, you know, nine people who are not going to hire you again. And so <laughs> it was I think the idea of understanding that it wasn't just the showrunners that you're performing for, but all of your colleagues who will then go on to different shows. I think that that penetrated that moment. Right, yeah, oh, that's wonderful. Alex, you're a conflict averse, but sometimes it finds you. How, how do you handle it? Yeah, I try to de-escalate at all costs. So hopefully, you know, avoid getting the getting to that point. I generally, you know, don't do anything over for by any means over text, you know, or over email or over, you know, I, I anything I want to resolve, I want to resolve face to face. You know, um, text messages sometimes get really heated. Uh, emails sometimes, you know, people will. Uh, I, I know one writer who was who's been fired multiple times, always because of a of a, uh, a an email sent in the heat of emotion. You know, it just keeps happening again and again and again. You know, he should know better by now. Uh, but if there's something, I I much prefer to settle it face to face in a in a. Sure a one-on-one -on -one scenario and and not yeah not throwing things around dana how about you ah i'm thinking it's been fortunately um a while since i have um had to but i agree with like the de-escalation the earlier also that um you know that something can be intercepted and diffused and like i mean i guess it depends on the type sometimes in a, you know, there are things in, in the room that were like a, a passionate disagreement about, um, you know, I'm thinking about how there are diff different types. So, um, you know, for me, like passionate disagreements about ideas, um, sometimes the sort of zooming out, and I wanna talk about that for a minute, because I think those can sometimes be, you know, kind of zooming out and making the point about how, how that doesn't have to get I think there's a way to sort of de-escalate those in a in a way that can be, you know, how the, how that can sort of serve us, or how how can we put this whatever may be going on to use in a way where it doesn't have to, you know, because I've seen, I mean, as we all have, I'm sure, sometimes like you know, people can get really, um, really, and the whole room, not just like two people, but you know, rooms can get really passionate about about story and pitches and invested in, in, you know, all that stuff. And so those I think are a little bit easier, but it can be interesting trying to kind of do something with that energy and kind of like, how can we use this and all of that? So there's that um, and, and where I think sometimes just kind of taking a step back and looking at like, if we're this, if we're this passionate about this, how can we put it to use? Um, and then as far as like personal, personal ones, it, yeah, I think, you know, being able to kind of look at what may be going on underneath it and absolutely like, you know, I agree, you know, talking to people face to face, you know, talking to people one-on-one -on -one and also just trying, you know, I mean, I think we all, many of us who end up in these positions, as we know, 
writing is one set of one skill set. People management is a whole other skill set um, <laughs> that that some people have, right? Um, naturally, more than others. Some people have learned more than others about it, um, and so I think it's you know being able to employ a little bit of our own um, psychology when possible in terms of understanding hopefully what may be going on underneath those those conflicts um, and being able to put, you know, when possible, uh, use a little bit of that, like being able to, to see, like, is there something going on behind whatever? Because usually, of course, those things are more than just about whatever is on the surface. So um, being able to, to, when possible, again, have those conversations and hope and recognize that if people are going to stay, when is when is something worth having a conversation about and when is it worth making a larger change? So I try to, for me, it's checking in with myself about what's the most useful thing. Is it, is it the most useful to go, okay, this seems like, again, something that's worth me in some way intervening, having conversations, blah, blah, blah. Like understanding what do I want out of this scenario? Do I want to sure. resolve this because I think I think this is, you know what I mean? So that's to me the step yeah. one, what do I want to get, what, what's my goal? And then, and then going into, am I intervening? Am I going, this has happened so much that somebody needs to be removed from this scenario. So understanding what I want first and then yeah. addressing it from there. That makes perfect sense. We could talk about this a lot longer, but we're, it's time for questions now. So let me get to the first question. And anybody can answer this. Any suggestions on how to break through the gatekeepers and get to the person with the hiring power? Everybody wants to know that. And, and by gatekeepers, are no they Yeah, I think that um, they're talking about agents and you know the producers that might read them so that they could get to um, the showrunners. You know, it's tough. It became. I had those relationships because I started out as an assistant in this business. As I, while I was working as a freelance writer, I was also working as an assistant at William Morris. So the other assistants who either then became agents or went off to be execs or they went off to be writers, it they almost became a pledge class for lack of a better word. And then, you know, joining different writers groups and then meeting people that had the same goals. And those friendships ended up being um, the, the calling cards for some places. Because I know that my manager or agents will read something if it's coming from another client. And, you know, I came to town not knowing anyone here. So that seems impossible if you're living somewhere else and you're thinking how you could crash in. But it's those relationships, those writers groups, those writing classes that you're taking, your professors, you might be surprised by how many um, crossover relationships you have that could be that one thing that gets you in the door. The contest also, um, and then befriending other assistants who do have their boss's ear. And I think that's helpful. So I've taken recommendations from, you know, some of the lower levels and from different assistants who say, you know, I think that you would like this person who's writing. Would you like to take a look? So it's it's relationships at the end of the day. Absolutely. Let me and get to the next programs. Oh, and definite. Hello. Just pro definitely and the programs. Mm -hmm. Yep. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. That that is a way that you can get in. And almost every network studio has a writing program and a shout out to my program, the CBS Diversity Writers Mentoring Program. Um, but let me get to the next question, which is really piggybacking on the previous one. Are you only reading scripts that come from agents and managers? I think, Michelle, you may have answered that, but Dana or Alex, are you reading only scripts that are coming from agents and managers? Um, for the most part, unless as in the yeah, unless as unless as Nichelle alluded to, there has to be some really direct kind of relationship that would that would lead to that exception, you know. So like you know, friend of a friend, there has to you know, unless there's some specific relationship that it would make an exemption. Sure. Yeah, sure. I, this just kind of points to what Nichelle said. I think befriending the gatekeepers is not uh, the worst thing in the world, you know. If you because it's not. I, I, at least in my case, it's not such a, a a totalitarian regime that I make all decisions unilaterally. There, it's a whole team of producers and and uh, and executives and uh, and fellow writers. So uh, if if my assistant comes to me and says, "You got to read this," I take it very very seriously. Or if an executive mm -hmm. or at the studio 
or at the network says, this is really, uh, you know, worth reading. I take it very, very seriously. The same way that if I get enthusiastic about something and the person says, are you really sure? I take that seriously too. So um, they're not there just to keep people out. I think if you right. have a, a connection and, and you know, in terms of, you know, if you want to, I don't think it's a good idea to try to go around that by, I don't know, like following me on Twitter or something, because that's, that's not, you know, <laughs> you have a friend that way. That isn't, you know, uh, and I mostly tweet about food. So it's not, it's not going to be that helpful. Uh, it, it's, oh, uh, it, so the, the, I, I think, I, I think not thinking of the the gatekeepers as people to keep you out, but people who really can advocate for you is a is uh, is is I think a, a better way to look at it. That is great. And this question I get all the time, and I'd love each of you to answer this. Um, I have an opportunity to pitch a project to a studio, and beforehand, I would like to partner with an established writer showrunner beforehand. Who wouldn't? What's the best approach to contact a showrunner for mentorship and partnership? How do people get to you if they have a project? Are you interested in other people's projects? Are you only interested in your own? How, how would somebody get to you? Well, mm. Malcolm and I are uh, have a production company, The 51, and we have a, our deal at uh, HBO, and that's a producing deal. That's not a writing deal. That's for us as producers, and so, Yes, in that way, um, we don't take things blind. It goes in through our managers and agents, but we are interested in producing other writers. And um, we've hired almost our entire careers, aspiring writers to work with us. So it's, you know, they start out as assistants and then you know, the um, young man who was our assistant six years ago, then became the writer's assistant on a project of Malcolm's, then the staff writer on first year of Truth Be Told, and then he went on and became a executive story editor on Falcon and Winter Soldier. And then he came back to Truth Be Told. So we do a lot of homegrown talent. Like we um, hire people who are helping us and so that we could help them. So every assistant that we've ever had works for us in some capacity or we've helped them get staffed on other shows or pursue whatever their dream is. So we started out that way. So that's why we're very conscious of that growth from you know showing up in this town with no connections and trying to make it. So it's important to us. And you know Malcolm does more than I do. I'm a little bit more of a private person than him, but he's constantly doing you know things for the guild or different speaking engagements. And um, we met, I mean, the woman that came once to do my nails, <laughs> she used, I loved her immediately. She used to work in the business and she um, got laid off and never could get her foot back in. And so we hired her at the 51 and she's invaluable. She's been with us for about two years now. Wow. Okay. So the answer there is contact the 51. Just kidding. Um, okay. <laughs> How do how do people if they have a project and they want you to be the showrunner on it? How do they get to you? Uh, that that yeah, it's not a a, a uh, facetious answer to contact the fifty one. I think if, if there are there are not every showrunner is you can't just find any showrunner. Uh, there are people who are going to be. Uh, as we learn from the showrunner training program, there are showrunners who want to create their own work, who want to put their own stamp onto it, who may take your idea away from you. I mean, if if, if the real idea is to have someone to sort of help you along and, and guide you uh, down that path, there, there it is someone who is more like a mentor uh, than mm -hmm. someone who is who has their own creative vision. So that requires finding some, a very specific kind of showrunner and not just any showrunner. And that's mm -hmm. where I, I think you, uh, your representation can help. Uh, if mm -hmm. you don't have representation, I think you know that's a different story. That's about like getting representation is another question uh, of how, how, how to answer. Uh, another how to panel. Get to, yeah. It's yeah, another right. panel. <laughs> Uh, it but, is. but you can't go find any any old showrunner because any old showrunner might have a completely different agenda than what you want for it. Mm -hmm. Right. Dana, what can you sure. add to that or would you add? Um, yeah, I, I'm thinking about what I can add that's um, 
valuable. Um, I also have, I have a company, um, Loud Sis Productions, that as I mentioned earlier, um, my deal is at Sony. And um, my the vision for Loud Sis is um, that we tell stories that are centered on people of color, underdogs, women's voices. Um, I do have a more specific vision. It kind of goes to what um, Alex is talking about. Like um, mine is a writer and producer driven company. Um, it is a combination of stories that I'm passionate about telling as well as we do also produce um, and oversee and supervise writers. But for me, I have a, a hell yes mantra about the stories <laughs> that I tell. So um, it has to be a hell yes for me. It doesn't mean that I'm necessarily always writing it, but um, I have to, it has to be a, a hell yes that it aligns with the visions of Loud Sis. So that may or may not be, you know, everything that comes in the door, right? Everything that, um, you know, people approach us with. Um, but you, yeah, you can absolutely, I'm not that hard to find um, at loudsys.com and at all the various ways that people can find wow. find us. But wow. th that, but that's the, that's the thing. It's just the question of whether or not what someone, the story someone wants to tell falls in a, a hell yes alignment with, with me and the vision of Loud Sis. Um, so it does, it goes back to what Alex said. It's like, we all have stories that we want to tell and it is about finding alignment, creative alignment with, you know, with a showrunner, with mentors, you know, we, we mentor a lot of people. We don't necessarily produce the work of, of everyone we mentor. So it is, it's sure. that type of, yeah, it's finding creative alignment. Great. Um, yeah. That's great. And I love how generous and open everyone is being here. Okay. D just, just as a matter of uh, information, at what point in the process of a television series are you hiring writers? During the development stage? during, as soon as you get a pickup, before you get a pickup, pre anybody? We started reading before the pickup. Yeah, we started reading and hiring and, and meeting with writers before the pickup because we were starting initially the first season, we were just going to do a room to break the season and then I would go off and write one and two and then Apple would make the decision because of, you know, convoluted circumstances, that room ended up being a go room. So I had those group of people and I added to it. So each time before you start, when you, once you start getting that feeling that it might be a go, we're start we're reading at that point. Great. Dana, how about you? Um, it depends on the project. Uh, we, we got, a, we had a series order for best man, for example. So we were, um, you know, pretty much once we, had all all the things we needed as far as cast commitments and all that. We were, you know, reading uh, pretty much right away. But yeah, I mean, I, in general, I think it is you. You are usually trying to um, kind of get ahead of that process as much as possible. So I do generally believe in once you have kind of the you know the good indication. Um, trying to read before a pickup is just a good idea, um, just so that you're not cons always buried under drowning under a pile of scripts. Sure, sure. Alex, anything to add to that? Agreed. The only thing I'd add is that I wouldn't take a meeting until after a pickup because you don't want to get into a meeting with a writer and, and then be like, oh, actually, we didn't get picked up. Sorry about that. <laughs> yeah, that that cool. is yeah. terrible. <laughs> okay. Um, we're, we're almost out of time. I'd like to ask each of you to answer this question. What's your biggest challenge as a showrunner? What's your biggest reward as a showrunner? Whoever would like to start. But do it because we're I running out of time. <laughs> the big, the biggest challenge is, um, and it was a little overwhelming, was all the personality management. And I don't mean negative personality management. I don't think that I'm waiting in there and breaking up fist fights or anything like that. I think it's the, um, you know, managing up, make sure all the executives feel tucked in and the studio and network, and then taking the temperature on your all of your writers. That. I found was a little bit more overwhelming than I thought it was going to be. And the biggest reward yeah. is just those moments where someone gets hired, whether it's the casting person, a department head, or um, one of the writers, and you could tell it made them happy. And there, there's just nothing like that. You know, um, one of our the actors who I love, she was like, I don't know how I'm going to pay my rent. And then she ended up getting cast on the show. And I I still have that letter that she wrote about it. It just was so touching. So those kind of things that are not on screen are where the answers are for me. 
Thanks, thanks. Mm -hmm. uh, Dana, briefly, biggest challenge, biggest reward. It's easy. For me, the biggest challenge is always the clock. For It's just always the clock uh, for me. And then reward is just getting to, you know, the magic of, of telling stories and playing in this world. It never, it never gets old to me. All of the elements of, of playing and, and being able to make up stories and be a storyteller. Great. Alex, take us home. Biggest challenge, biggest reward. The biggest challenge is that you are ultimately responsible for fucking everything. You know, and, and there's kind of no to it. And you have to have to make some decisions about when do I just like, what do I put off? What do I have to handle now? What do I des delegate to some other someone else? And when do I, you know, go back to my family? Um, the greatest reward, I mean, on the last show, we were able, to, I, I did, we were able to have, you know, over 180 people who worked on the show whose relatives were part of the internment and they finally got to see their story told. That's hugely rewarding. Mm. Yes, mm. yes. Well, that is um, all the time we have. This was a wonderful panel. Thank you so, so much. And Dana, back to you. Thank you so very much, Carol, and to all of our panelists, guest speakers um, over the past two days. These have been a dynamic two days. And though I'm on this side of the camera and I've, I've learned so much just as, about the business as a whole, about strategy, about leaning in and storytelling, um, it's just been absolutely wonderful. There are just so many insightful questions and answers and comments. And for each and every one of you out there, we will uh, start to post clips in some of the panels uh, from the past two days on the Walter Cates website. So keep your eyes uh, peeled for that. We all have a story to tell. Beautiful, complex, fascinating stories. Told through a lens of varying shades and experiences. That's the power of art imitating life. It cannot be defined or confined to one space. So let your creativity soar. Fill the page, press record, and dare to captivate the masses with your authentic voice. We all have a story to tell. What's yours?